So I'd like to read to you the University of Nebraska Land Acknowledgement. As a land-grant institution, we strive to connect the land, knowledge, and access. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. We begin this effort to acknowledge what has been buried by honoring the truth. We are standing on the ancestral lands of the first people who occupied this area we now call Nebraska. We pay respect to Native elders, past and present. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that brings us here together today. This knowledge allows us to better understand our opportunity to impact the state of Nebraska and beyond, and occupying these lands is a result of a history of Native and Indigenous people's experience of displacement, violence, settlement, and survival, which continues to inform our present and our future. So it is my pleasure to introduce you our keynote speaker for our Rising Star Institute 2022 conference. Dr. Kira Mossad is here with us from Washington State. For those from Washington State, you can raise your hand. Yeah. All right. Former here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not going to read uh, Dr. Mossad's bio because it's a program for you, um, but I'll just highlight a few things. So she is a, a practicing clinical psychologist. Um, she has become famous in Washington State since the pandemic um, because of her work on the behavioral health strike team for the state of Washington. She's also a professor at Seattle University. So she brings to us as instructional administrators a really wonderful uh, balance of expertise um, in behavioral health impacts of a crisis as well as the impact on um, students and teachers um, when we are working and leading through a pandemic. She has spoken to my college um, twice. She has been a um, NCIA chat speaker once, and uh, her Zoom recorded presentations have been going around the Washington State Community and Technical Colleges for the last two years. Um, and we just hear really wonderful responses from people who experience validation that what you are personally feeling and experiencing with pandemic brain is real and Dr. Masek will validate that for you so we're all in it together um, and also um, really importantly give you tools to help yourself and to help faculty and staff in your departments. So this is really part of that theme of mental health and, mental, and overall wellness that we want to create to, as a theme throughout the entire conference. So she'll be with us for an hour and a half, and we'll have um, lots of time for Q&A. So um, please keep those um, uh, ready to go at the end. And then um, Saturday morning, we're going to have a panel to help us further process and think about what we hear today from Dr. Massa. So keep those questions um, brewing in your mind as well. Thank you, Susie. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me today. Um, I am glad that lunch was a little late because there's a reason I don't teach class at 1.30 at CLU. Everybody kind of nods off, so I'll try to keep you awake a little bit. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and jump right in. We're going to talk about what's going on with the landscape of behavioral health and the complicated nature of not just the pandemic over the last couple of years, but the recent school shootings and um, additional types of crisis that are part of the disaster landscape in general and how they affect how we function. I'm going to share a little bit about what research tells us works for best practices. Uh, I'm going to cover a little bit about grief and loss. Every single person in this room and on every Zoom that I've participated in has lost something in the last couple of years. And working through and acknowledging grief and loss is going to be, in my opinion, at least part of our collective recovery from this experience. I'm going to share with you an acronym model that I developed called LEARN, which is a very brief summary of behavioral health tools that you can use to um, assess crisis and intervene in a sort of a workplace or a family appropriate way. Um, these are things that do not require a license, they're not official, it's just a model that you can use to help provide behavioral health support to colleagues or friends or loved ones um, that we know work, evidence-based. 
And then a little bit of discussion about what resilience is. Um, it's fast becoming a word people are tired of hearing. I get it. Um, Self-care is that for me as a, as a mom of two young kids. Self-care feels like something else on my to-do list that I never have time for. So resilience, I'm hoping it won't go that direction, but it kind of feels like it already is. So we'll talk a little bit about that, but hopefully painlessly. All right. I'd like to start with this chart um, because it gives you a sense of what disasters do. And people are actually fairly predictable in this regard. This is a chart that was designed by SAMHSA and probably more than 10 years ago now, but it summarizes the pattern of behavioral health response to any large-scale critical incident. Uh, Hurricane Katrina, 9-11, tsunami in Southeast Asia in 2006, uh, Fukushima nuclear meltdown. And they looked at patterns of response over all the major disasters for years and, and kind of put this together. So you have the impact phase, which is typically zero to 48 hours post-event. A heroic and honeymoon is usually around a month in. That was when everybody was watching The Tiger King the first time and hoarding toilet paper. Not just in Washington. I don't think the hoarding toilet paper was just a Washington thing. I think that was happening everywhere. Um, that was this. This is all 2020. And then we went down into the disillusionment phase. And disillusionment is the hardest phase of any part of the disaster cycle because that's when the reality of what's really happened sinks in. Uh, the resources start to run out. The limits of the ability to bounce back become very clear. And unfortunately for everyone in this room, the disillusionment phase happened right at the beginning of the school year, into the fall and winter, which is a really challenging time for a lot of kids anyway, and for us. Um, we worked through it. We got into the reconstruction phase, which is the final phase, and then Delta and Omicron happened. So what ended up happening with COVID as a disaster is what we refer to as a disaster cascade. That's a specific term that describes multiple large-scale impacts that happen within the same window of time that it would take you to recover from the first impact. So you just keep on getting kind of smashed by things. Delta in Washington state was August and September of 2021. And then Omicron was January, right? December and into January. So the exact time frames for these variant and secondary and tertiary impacts are gonna be different, but very similar all over the United States. The point being, is that whenever you have a gathering of people, there are lots of different behavioral health trajectories that are being experienced by families, um, by adults, and kids alike. Right now, we're right about here, right? So in any group of people, you've got some folks that are feeling pretty good. Got their feet under them, feeling like the weather's getting better, the summer's right there around the corner, like time, time frame wise, it feels okay. You have some people who are starting to feel better, like maybe you have a little bit more coping skills and feeling more, um, more sort of acceptant about what's happened. And then you have other families and individuals who are really struggling. When you look at baseline, your baseline is what you're coming in with. That's how well you were doing with behavioral health before COVID even happened. When you look at this relative to baseline, some people are back to baseline and some people are definitely not. So the reason why I share this is because a disaster cascade can explain in part why this academic year felt worse than last year. Because it did, in a lot of ways, I think. And I think that was a surprise to many people. We were dealing with already depleted resources. We were tired, worn down, and we had been teaching online or in some kind of a hybrid way or I mean, we're back and forth between them, happened in all kinds of different ways all over the country. And then most people came back in person this fall, and the behavioral health management that was needed on the part of faculty and students alike and staff was pretty astronomical. Um, you might have had kids, again, K up through, you know, any, any really level of education who were previously engaged and participatory and now they're getting in fights or yelling at, at classmates and responding very intensely to things. I'm gonna talk about why that's happening in a second, but this is, this is some landscape for you, some context. When we look at long-term outcomes, this chart is based on aggregated data, again, from all kinds of big disasters over the last 20 years or so. And the good news is, is that even in a cascade type of a situation, resilience is the most common outcome. Um, COVID is gonna be slightly different than this because it's so complex. So I don't think these numbers are gonna look quite this way, um, but resilience is still gonna be the most common outcome in the long run. We get a chance we will be able to recover to our race. 
Symptom acuity is the next biggest section of the pie, and symptom acuity just means symptoms, typically of anxiety or depression or panic, but not enough to meet the clinical threshold for a diagnosis, for that cutoff. New diagnoses or conditions are probably going to occur in about 7 to 10 percent of people, mostly youth. The demographic area of highest concern right now are adolescent females between 8 and 13, by far. Um, in terms of psychological distress and behaviors that we're seeing. And that's, that's kind of national. And then unfortunately, there's another smallest piece of the pie. It's a good thing it's the least likely option. It's called chronic dysfunction. Chronic dysfunction is, de uh, is defined as functional impairment, where people are so strongly impacted by what's happened in the disaster that they lose the ability to function effectively at work or at home or socially. They can't really engage in an appropriate or an effective way. So it becomes a disability in that regard. So this is what we're looking at, long-term outcome. And the reason why I'm sharing this with you is because none of this stuff is inevitable. But my perspective on it is that we're coming from a place right now when we get into the summer and get a chance to breathe, before we get into next academic year, we have the chance to sort of work on resources to get more people on the resilience pathway. This is not, this is not inevitable over here. So we have, we, have, we have choices to make and things we can do. So what's happening fundamentally underneath all of this? I love the brain slide. The brain stuff is my favorite. Anybody see the Oscars? What happened with Will Smith? I saw Will Smith go up on stage and that whole thing. And I thought, oh no. Will Smith just had a limbic system moment on national television. <laughs> That's what I thought. I know my lens is of a psychology lens. But let me tell you, the limbic system has been influencing our behavior, our choices, our thinking for a long time. Most people's brains right now are much more limbically active than they normally would be. And there are consequences for that. The limbic system's job is to keep you alive and keep you safe. It is not the job of the limbic system to think about consequences and appropriateness and whether you should hit send on that email right now, right? So your limbic system needs some regulation. And the job of the prefrontal cortex is to regulate it. But that's not been happening as much. And the reason why is that when we get confronted with multiple disasters, cascading events, I mean, the murder hornets, all this stuff, right? There were all these, I mean, that was Washington, I guess. But there were all these weird things that happened over the last couple of years. Every time there's a new thing, our limbic system is like, how threatening is this? Is this a big deal? Do I need to do something here? How do I stay safe? And when your limbic system is so active for so long, you don't make decisions very well. The younger you are, the harder that is. Because the prefrontal cortex does not get completely developed until people are in their early 20s. So understanding where the behaviors are coming from that you might be seeing or even experiencing, we have all had a limbic system moment or 10. Right? Not just Will Smith here. We have all done this. And then the reason that you know that it's a limbic system moment is when, like about 45 minutes later, you think, where did that come from? Yeah. Why did I just act that way? Yeah. Where, where, what is that about? Right? So your prefrontal cortex takes a little while. And I'll talk more about this in a minute, but one of the helpful hints here is that the biggest thing we can do to regulate the limbic system is to slow down. If you pause before you offer a hand gesture to another driver, it might be like this instead of something else, right? <laughs> Give yourself a moment to just pause and breathe and slow down, and that gives your prefrontal cortex a chance to check the limbic system and say, eh, maybe that's not the best idea. They need to do something else here, right? So they need to work together, and the faster you respond, the more this is in charge, in general. Okay, these are some other examples of common struggles. And I've used this slide consistently for two years because not a whole lot has changed here. Um, different emphases at different times in the, in the disaster cycle. One of the biggest issues, I'll give you the one, my new favorite term, revenge bedtime procrastination. Huh. I didn't invent it, I wish I had. Um, revenge bedtime procrastination is when you stay up until 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock in the morning or even 4 o'clock in the morning on TikTok or Instagram, scrolling and scrolling and scrolling forever. For no reason, like really no good reason, besides that you're trying to reclaim part of your day or your life. The fact that there's a term for this, I'm not going to ask for a show of this. <laughs> okay, I mean, we all do it. Like, people do it from time to time, right? It's disrupting our sleep and your brain to help balance out that cognitive 
limbic system, prefrontal cortex issues, needs sleep, needs rest in order to balance itself and recover. So we're not doing ourselves any favors with the revenge bedtime procrastination, but we're all doing it. Um, what else on here? The cognitive issues. Uh, Susie was mentioning COVID brain, pandemic brain. It would be very surprising to me if everyone in this room at some point in the last 18 months didn't wonder, am I getting early onset dementia? Is that what this is? Or um, am I getting ADHD? Never had those symptoms before, but that's what it feels like. That is normal. <laughs> Please spread the good word about how normal that is. Let people know that all of our brains are functioning this way, and it really influences how we perceive other people, the choices we make, um, our confidence in ourselves. Like, man, I, how did I miss that meeting? Did I actually send that email that I was supposed to send? Like that, that, that fuzzy brain where you can't focus and you get distracted and you can't remember things. Totally normal in these large scale events. Um, if there are, I can take questions about this if there are any, but we'll, we, can, we can save that for the end. So. Okay, so what do we need to get better here? These are the four things that your brain has to have to feel good. So to feel pleasure, to feel fun, to feel comfortable, dopamine and serotonin are neurotransmitters, two of the five major ones that we have, and oxytocin and endorphins are hormone packages, basically, groups of hormones. So between the four of these things, this is all the good stuff. And in a disaster cascade scenario, all four of them tend to become depleted because we get worn down, which is maybe no surprise. So if you are feeling depleted, it looks like that. As examples, right? The trick is, how do we recover some of that depletion, but do so in a way that's not gonna cause bigger consequences for ourselves? Because one of the sort of the quick fix problems is substance use, right? A lot of people go in that direction in order to try and feel good temporarily, and then it causes other problems especially so for teenagers and young adults as we move into the summer. You, you all know what a high-risk time graduation can be for reckless driving, substance use, drinking and driving, all that kind of thing. It's not just teenagers that need this. We all do, but we need to go about feeling good, blowing off steam, having a good time in a way that's not gonna cause bigger harm. Some ideas, including, if you notice, Star Trek is on the list. That's a big one. Um, thank you. Um, lots of other options. If, if you look at themes here, you see sensory stuff, sight, touch, taste, smell, and sound, and movement. Which is not to say you have to sign up to like run a marathon this summer, but, but getting up regularly and moving and doing it consistently, like some kind of movement, just walking around, walking about something every day consistently is going to help with all of that neurophysiological regulation. Okay, so I'm going to transition away from the neuropsych into the practical. Now that you have that understanding about the limbic system dysregulation, how does it show up? Um, one of the big areas is with cells of communication and regulation. So where we want to be when we communicate with other people is in the brain zone. It's where we want students to be too, but after lunch especially, not so much, often. Right? So I, I, for those of you who've heard my spiels before, I usually had included this. To get from the yellow zone or the blue zone into the green zone, the most effective way to do that is to physically get up and move. The older you are, you can, you can stretch it out to about like once every 45 minutes to an hour, but the younger people are, they need to be getting up you know, every 15 to 30 minutes and doing something physical. Because when you activate both halves of your body, it activates both hemispheres of the brain, right? Left side controls the right hemisphere and vice versa. And in order to, to get that neuroregulation that we need, both hemispheres have to be active. So physically getting up and moving, um, even if you're just doing like laps around your dining room table or your office or work, whatever, that's gonna help with that, to get to the, to the brain zone. The tricky part is when people are in red. That's when it is potentially dangerous and the escalation is needed. People can be in red because of panic, excitement, anxiety, or just straight up anger. Lots of different reasons. But when people are in the red zone, it means that the body has released a little bit of adrenaline, usually. And it takes the human body 45 to 60 minutes to metabolize adrenaline. So when someone is red, it's going to take almost an hour to move to green. This is not something that you can fix by having a calm and thoughtful conversation. This is going to take time and space. It's not something, people don't de-escalate that fast. They do de-escalate, but it's, it's a process. Now they can escalate immediately because adrenaline can be released immediately. 
but going backwards is a harder, harder process because it takes longer. Uh, I, I will share some more info about de escalation in a second, but keep that in mind. Where you are when you're trying to engage and where they are. Because if either person is in the red zone, you're not going to be very effective. It's not going to be a problem solving kind of strategy, not a conversation at all. Okay, this is the other core staple of behavioral health recovery from disasters in general and crisis. We need to be doing more of this. Uh, this is not something that you usually do at work, especially for people in leadership positions. The job is to solve problems, right? People come to you with problems that need to be fixed. So that's, it's like triage all the time. This is the opposite of that. This is about listening to somebody else with the intention of understanding, not fixing. And it just feels so awkward, or it can. Especially if you're not used to doing it. Because it feels like you're not really doing anything. But let me tell you, disaster research and recovery shows us that you're not actually gonna fix people's stresses by having a dialogue with them. You can't. So when you try to, it makes both parties feel frustrated. So what you wanna be doing is asking open-ended questions to try and have the purpose of the interaction be about understanding the other person's experience, not fixing anything for them. Um, it's, it's tough, and it takes, some, uh, it takes some practice, but this is something that you can do in five minutes or 20 minutes, it's not a therapy session, so don't worry about that, right? It's just about listening in a different way, and it's very clear that the research supports this. So give it, give it a shot, maybe try it. Um, when The next time you have an opportunity to interact with a colleague or a family member and support them, try to do this and not to fix anything for them and see if it doesn't go differently. I'm, invite, I'm going to invite you now, um, if you have your phones with you, to click on the QR code or follow the link um, and add to this Padlet. I created this Padlet for you all to do a little bit of reflection about what's been lost and what's been found. It's anonymous, but I do encourage you to use it for its intended purpose about a little bit of process for what, what you lost and what you found. Um, just some reflection. It can be a picture, it can be a word, a sentence or two. You add to it by clicking on the, on the bottom corner. Um, over the last two years, literal metaphorical to you. When we get done, I'm going to come back to the Padlet and, and talk a little bit about what you've added to that. And it'll be available to you in an unwilling way. So you can add to it at any point. We're going to transition now to talking about grief and loss, which is why I and obviously no wrong answers. There are no wrong answers. These are some examples, things folks are sharing. Some of it's, it's, it's unclear in some regard if you've been something that you've lost or something you wrote down and hope that you're found with the or the passion. Maybe you lost it too, I don't know. Maybe it's both. It could be both. Lost normal and embrace that normal. Part of the challenge of what we've lost and found is that many of us have lost relationships with people who are still living. And the nature of the way that this disaster has unfolded has um, been challenging in, in that unique way. It's not so direct. It can be relationships that shift, people who believe in different things that are different than what you may believe, and that has really challenged our, our family and, and social relationships for sure. I encourage you to continue to think about this and add to it. We'll come back.
Okay. Um, to share with each other when you have a chance to, to just have some conversation about this. Things that you may have lost, some relationships, some physical spaces, vacation, time off, a different perspective on that. But things that you may have found, new relationships, new connections, new hobbies. Please don't raise your hand if you started breaking sourdough bread. <laughs> or collecting houseplants, right? Uh, new patterns of work or at home. Um, I'm going to talk about this briefly and then I'm going to transition into a, a model that I developed about it. So, people who have lost someone might, might want you to keep in mind the following. Even when things are happy, there's an experience that someone's not there who should be. Small talk is painful sometimes because it doesn't feel very important. One of the, and I don't need to read you all of the things here, but one of the most important takeaways is that it really is okay to ask someone about their loss. We tend to try and avoid it because we don't want to hurt them, and we don't want to bring it up because we don't want to hurt them, but they're thinking about it anyway. And if you allow someone who's grieving the window of opportunity to talk about their loss, that's actually often very helpful for both parties. Um, and, but it's something that we tend to shy away from. So please don't be afraid to ask. Okay, for a professional lens, when you're working on supporting people who have lost something, and remember I started by saying everyone has lost something, right? Different kinds of things. The one thing I want to mention here is that it's pretty classic. We've all done it. I've done it a million times. You say, let me know how I can help, right? I would like to offer the idea that rather than saying, let me know how I can help, that we transition into offering a specific and discreet task. Can I drop some groceries off at your house for you? Can I get the oil change in your car? Can I take your kids to the park for a few hours? Can I run an errand for you? Right? It doesn't matter what it is. But if you offer something specific, it gives the person who's grieving a chance to say yes or no, but also not have to come up with something. Sometimes you don't know what it is you need. And so offering a, some, a specific task can be very, very helpful. OK, so this is the model that is not the stages of grief. Not about that. This is about considerations of moving through grief and loss. And there's all kinds of forms, right? Identity, safety, a sense of security. It's not just the loss of a loved one. There is no right or wrong way to process this. Um, I think some of the things that we get hung up on are time frame, like, oh, we should feel differently within a certain amount of time, or it should look this way after a certain amount of time. No, I have to use an inappropriate word. No not true. Um, you do what your process needs to be for you. And part of the issue that's happened with COVID is that we haven't been able to, right? Culturally appropriate traditions and rituals and ceremonies are things that we may not have had the opportunity to participate in. But it's not too late. And, and that's part of what this is about, is, is even though time has passed, we need to start operating out of emergency mode and back into, let's actually process some of the things that took place over the last couple of years. So that's the first step, honoring the loss, recognizing it, talking about it. And the Padlet was designed in part to get that conversation started, recognizing what it is and putting words to it. Here's my clinical hat, right? Here's my clinical psychology hat. Um, we need to talk about it. If you don't want to start a journal, do not start a journal. I had a, I had a client one time tell me, if someone else tells me to start a journal, my head is going to explode. Um, so if it's not for you, don't do it. There's lots of things that you can do to share memories, look at pictures, all kinds of stuff. Kids need to be included in honoring the loss. They need to be part of that process in a developmentally appropriate way. Adults usually make the mistake of withholding information or lying to kids even in an attempt to protect them, and that doesn't work. The way kids' brains process loss is that they will often make something up and often sort of orient it around something they did or didn't do in order to make sense of it. So it's really helpful for adults to give kids accurate and appropriate information. The next one is expressing emotion. Um, anger is a body part emotion. Anger protects people from feeling sadness and fear. And anger is right here. It's at the surface neurologically. It's very easy to access. It's part of the limbic system, right? Um, anger is also, also culturally appropriate. It's OK to be mad, but it's not nearly as OK to be sad or to be scared. So anger shows up when we have a harder time processing those deeper things. Um, 
One of the quotes that I want to share with you that I heard recently that I love says, I sat with my anger long enough for her to tell me her real name was grief. And I think that's part of what's happening here, that we're, that we're seeing social media experience. And there's so much stuff that gets funneled into an anger lens um, when really it's not about that. But one of the ways we can help process that is by doing active listening. Because that allows the person to sort of talk through why they're mad and really kind of get to the source of it underneath. I, I don't know this because I haven't actually collected data on it, but as a psychologist, I, I would estimate that over 90% of anger is really not anger. It's about something else that's very good. Um, sometimes it's just maddening because somebody's grabbing too fast, too slow in the left lane or whatever, but um, sometimes it's just that, sometimes it's not. The third part of the model is about acknowledging the obstacles, and this is the if then. If you find yourself saying in your head, if COVID had never happened then, if I had just said this to them, then, if they had just done this, then, if then, if then, if then, right? If your brain is stuck on if thens, it prevents you from sort of moving forward. Sometimes we can't move on. We're not putting everything in the past, but we need to keep going. So if you catch yourself saying if then, what you need to try to do is say, but it just did. I recognize that that is a huge oversimplification, but just because something simple doesn't mean it's easy to do. So if your brain gets stuck on it, it you know, it, uh, tell yourself, oh, I'm doing it again, but it just did. And see what happens. And see what happens with that process. The third part, of, sorry, the final part of the model here is about living, and it's about sort of starting with survival, just doing whatever it is you have to do to breathe and sleep and eat, and then eventually, on no one else's time frame but your own, reconnecting and engaging in a way that makes sense to you participating in things that are, that are bigger than you, right? Um, the, the biggest part is that it's no one else's expectation or time frame. It has to be what you, what you are ready for. Keeping this in mind, too, that the children and youth that we are all working with, and young adults, right, are all part of grief and loss. Like, they have lost things, too. And so this process is going to need to be something we acknowledge at this little bit. Okay, I'm going to share with you a new model now. I like to put things in acronyms because it helps me remember stuff, but if it doesn't work for you, that's okay. Um, just keep the pieces that do. So this is about the fact that behavioral health isn't going away. Disaster recovery, recovery isn't going away. We're going to be dealing with this stuff for a while. So more tools for the toolbox that help us assess and offer interventions that are appropriate in the workplace, at school, or with family members. Things that anybody can do, right? The first one, shock probably is no surprise, active listening that you're already familiar with. And here's how you know us. But, you know, for those of you in the room, I'm not going to name any names, but for those of you in the room who tend to be fixers and problem solvers, it might be everybody, I don't know, um, the reason when you know that you should be doing active listening instead of problem solving is when you hear the yeah buts. You say, have you tried this? And they say, yeah, but I don't know if that would work for me. Yeah, but I already did, and that didn't go this way. Or yeah, but I don't think I have time to do it that way. If you hear yeah but, yeah but, yeah but, Try to put away the problem solving and try to focus on active listening and understanding. The yeah buts are the signal that you should be active listening rather than fixing. Second part here is about engagement. So this is um, beyond listening. If someone is really mad, really angry, one of the best things you can say is let's go take a walk. Walk and talk for two reasons. If you are physically, I'm gonna stand up for a second. If you're physically aligned with someone, if you're mad, and we're walking and talking, He's not going to throw a punch from away, right? You can be physically aggressive with somebody who's next to you. But also there's this strong psychological message that I'm literally on your side. We are allied against the issues that face us both. And what we tend to do, thank you, if we sit down across a table from each other, or on the other side of a desk, I'm confrontational. And that's a, that's a, a posture that we don't want to take, even though we don't mean to. So um, sitting down next to somebody, or walking and talking with them, is a great de-escalation tool, as well as just you, right? If I stand up here in front of you all and slow down my rate of speech, lower the register of my voice just a little bit, take a big deep breath, and you can see my shoulders go down. Did anybody else take a deep breath? I didn't tell you to do it, right? I'm just trying to calm myself 
and you're doing it by extension. So we have mirror neurons that copy each other. And what you're bringing to someone who's very worked up in crisis, angry, panicking, whatever the case may be, who you are as a person, is a huge piece of appropriate behavioral health engagement. So being really, really attentive about your non-verbals. If you're upset too, that's not going to work for de-escalation, right? Um, all, of the, all of the things about not blocking exits. If someone's panicking, if they're having a panic attack, you want to get them grounded in, the, in, the, in their senses. So what's something I ask people to do sometimes is to tell me how many colors they can pick out in the carpet. And, you know, commercial carpet has like a gazillion colors and everything. So I'm like, oh, what is that? Red, blue? And they're like, that's a stupid question. Why do you care? What can I tell you? What do you see? But it gets their brain onto something completely different. If your school nurse's office doesn't have a bunch of oranges in the freezer, um, I would encourage them to add them. Oranges are a great tool when they're frozen for people who are panicking and anxious. You pull out a frozen orange, you pick it, you peel it, right? And the scent is usually good, but also when you're holding a really cold object, it short circuits that part of the brain and that's, it's like, it's like cold, 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 and that's all you're thinking about. It's incredibly effective for reducing panic and anxiety. Um, and oranges are, I would say, fairly easy to come by. Um, not when people are mad, though. Frozen orange is a projectile. Okay. The other thing that I would just really advise you to do, if you don't have one already, get an index card, get a Word document on your desktop, get all of your behavioral health resources in one spot. EAP, crisis lines, whatever, just get it, get it all together. <laughs> Put it in one spot um, so that it's available and you don't have to go digging around online and doing things. Right? Put it all in one spot. Yeah. Question? Yeah. I just said. Put that in your syllabus. Yeah, absolutely. That's it. <laughs> yeah, syllabus is a good idea so that the resources are right there on Canvas, etc. Okay. Um, the third part here is about assessing urgency. Um, is it medical? Is it immediate? Is there a risk of self harm? I'm sure that many of you already know this, but it's worth a repeat. One of the biggest misconceptions about suicide reduction is that it increases risk to ask if someone is safe. It does not increase risk, let me make that abundantly clear. The research could not be more clear on this. It does not increase risk to ask directly and kindly and gently if someone is thinking of hurting themselves or committing suicide. It does not. We need to be become more comfortable with asking that question. And if that's something you've never asked anybody, then I would advise you to kind of come up with a way that would be comfortable for you in your own language, in your own terms and style, right? How you would be willing to ask that question because it reduces risk, but doesn't increase it. Yes, but they say yes. Yeah. Or they it depends on what your role is. But number one is to not handle it alone. If someone says yes, I am a, I am a threat to myself, I'm gonna hurt myself, immediately you do not handle it alone. They have no, well, medically, from a medical license perspective, they don't have any expectation of confidentiality when there's an immediate risk of harm. So you would need to follow whatever protocol your, your organization or school would set forward. But number one recommendation to all people is that if someone tells you they're suicidal, you immediately get help from someone else so that it's not just you and them. And you don't handle it by yourself. Um, and again, the resources are going to be very regionally dependent on what you do next. Yeah. Yes. Ideally, yes. Absolutely. But yeah. Depending on. So I don't think it's on this slide, but you know, an intention, the access, the plan. Like there's sort of these three things that we ask about. Do you have the intention to hurt yourself? Not just an idea, but the intention to do it. Do you have a specific plan of what you would do, and do you have the means to carry it out? Those are the three levels of risk, like three legs of the stool. And to the extent that someone says yes to any of them, it increases risk. But if it's yes to all three, that's the highest level of danger. If they say yes in general, it shouldn't be something you handle along. But what you do next depends on how high the risk is, potentially, and what the resources are that are available. Ideally, you make a warm handoff, which means to another person or a professional. You're not just letting them go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If we ask the question, not only of them being possibly hurting themselves, but others, yeah. considering all of what's been going on lately, yeah. Tulsa to yeah. you know, New York, 
Texas, um, then what would we take the same approach as we would if they were possibly hurting themselves or thinking about hurting themselves? You would take the same approach of not keeping it a secret and not handling it alone. Um, the resources that you would engage to help them would, might be different, depending on what they're saying. Um, but that is absolutely something that you wouldn't want to just let be, right, and let them let them walk out the door. Um, we're, we are operating right now in a harm reduction environment where we need to be responsive and to treat all of those things, whether it's suicide or homicide, as a serious thing every time. It's never funny. It's never a joke. Even if someone is saying it that way, part of the education needs to be around the not, but it's not funny. <laughs> it's not a joke. So we're going to follow it seriously and take it seriously every single time. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. One of my favorite questions to figure out how someone's really doing is the magic wand question. Um, if things were going to be better for you, what would that look like? If you were to wake up tomorrow and everything was the way you want, what would it look like? And if you have a student or a colleague who says nothing, nothing will make this better. That is a huge red flag for hopelessness. Right? That gives you a lot of information about how they're really doing. On the same token, if they say, oh, um, that $500 million lottery win and a unicorn ride to the moon, and they're not being sarcastic, that's also a red flag that something else is kind of going on there psychologically. So this is a great question to ask. Um, you can do it in a way that, that fits you or suits you. This is my favorite because this is the positive stuff. And when people are in crisis, whether they're angry or panicking or sad, just having a really bad day, they forget about the strengths and the resources that they already have. So you want to figure out a way, either directly or subtly, to identify these things. Um, depending on your relationship with the person and what role you have, um, <laughs> when I trained this out before, I had somebody say, I'm not a therapist, I'm not gonna ask somebody to make a list of their resources. Like, what are your internal strengths? Let's write them down. Right? If that feels weird to you, don't do it that way. That's fine. You can be very subtle. Um, our graduate assistant at the front desk in the psych department last week was having a really, like, she was just looking sad. And so I said, how are you doing? And she's like, eh, I'm not that great. It's been a really hard week. And then because I don't have that kind of relationship with her, I chose the subtle approach. And I said, well, um, do you have any plans this weekend to do anything fun with friends? I'm getting information about social connections, hobbies, interests, like what are the plans, right? She's like, well, yeah, actually, I'm gonna meet some friends and we're gonna go have lunch at Gasworks Park. Perfect. And then thinking about that actually reminded her that she had something to look forward to. So it was my way of assessing, like, are you, you know, are you feeling okay? Do you have something going here? Um, and then she did have some social support as well. So you can be really subtle with it. It doesn't have to be like, oh, let's make a list of your resources. Um, for what you can do on Saturday morning or whatever it is. Different approaches. Okay. Um, the last step is what, what's next, right? I don't want to throw out a model without like identifying what's the next thing that needs to happen. If you can have a one-on-one -on -one next week on a regular basis, if this is a colleague that you're concerned about, okay, great. If this is a student that you need to follow up with counseling support, um, depending on what the issues are that have been brought up, is this an EAP referral that they need, you know, is this a, a hospital visit? Like how urgent is this? What do you need to do next? Or is this somebody that you can just check in with via email in a little while and just, how are you really doing, right? But I, getting that clear for yourself, what's next for them, gives you a meaning. Okay. <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about um, resilience. <laughs> the new R word, I don't know. Um, these are the four ingredients of resilience. And, I mean, they're all really meaningful, but they've all, been, they've all been threatened in a lot of ways over the last couple of years. So when we go through a large-scale disaster, our purpose gets upended, because I can pretty much guarantee you that anyone in this room who had plans for a big vacation in 2020 didn't get to do it, right? So whatever your plans were at Christmas time in 2019, they got upended by whatever happened in March of 2020. And we need to re-motivate. We need to think about our purpose. If your purpose as an educator and as a leader is different now than it was when you started or even a couple years ago, it's helpful to redefine that, to be honest with yourself. I have a different set of goals. Whatever the goals are that you set need to be achievable in order to reinforce purpose. If you're still setting goals that are out too far, that are unrealistic, you're 
you're psychologically setting yourself up for the repeat experience of failure, which is damaging, right? So you want to make sure that the goals you're setting for yourself, for your staff, in a leadership lens are, are achievable. They're the right size. That's going to reinforce purpose, success, and attention to it, attention to success. Connection is anything that prevents you from being isolated, and I mean anything. Hobbies, groups online, uh, social justice issues, causes that bring you together with other people, but anything that, that draws you with other folks, right? It doesn't matter what they are. Um, pets have saved people's lives as a form of connection in the last two years. Pets are, are great. Um, a, a relationship with God or a higher power, right? Lots of different ways to be connected. But isolation has been so incredibly damaging, especially to, to young adults. Um, this one is the hardest. We don't like to adapt. Human beings really struggle with adaptability, but it's also, as it always is, the most important. Um, adaptability is enhanced when you teach yourself how to perceive something unexpected as a challenge rather than a threat. So that's how you practice adaptability. Remember the limbic system thing? It feels like 10 hours ago, the brain, with the prefrontal cortex, all of that. If your brain perceives something as a threat, your limbic system gets activated and you can run, hide, or fight. That's kind of it. But if you perceive it as a challenge, a staffing shortage, a budget cutback, flat tire, whatever, it's like, okay, what's my next step? What's my resource? Who do I call? Like, what do I do next? If you start to think that way, that is how you practice adaptability. And it gets easily reinforced because it works. And then hope. If you do this, if you do that adaptability thing, hope is the byproduct. Hope is what you get when you practice this. Because when you're threatened all the time, that does not feel hopeful. But when you're a problem solver, you're like, okay, I can see my way out of this, out of this tunnel here, where we're in. What are the realistic opportunities? Hope is not the same thing as optimism. Um, hope is grounded in reality, and as a result, hope is the only one of these four that is really influenced by cultural experience. People who have been subjected to discrimination, racism, marginalization, are much, um, I should say, have a harder time accessing hope, maybe, than people who have not experienced those things. There is a reason that hope is a fundamental message in a lot of like big social events, sometimes, sometimes campaigns, right? Hope has been a theme that has been really important um, over history, but it affects people with different lived experiences in very different ways. So those are the four things that we want to try and buoy up here a little bit. The metaphor is a tree. Help you remember, right? The purpose is the fruit of the tree. The adaptability is the trunk of the tree that sways in the storm. Hope is the moss that grows on the north side of the tree where it's dark and cold. Hope finds a way. The moss likes it over there, right? And the connection are the roots of the tree that ground you, those are your people, that give you strength and support. Okay, what does the research say works as a from, from a leadership lens? In crisis, um, something that I think is phenomenally frustrating is that, um, especially in an educational setting, most people just assume that as leaders, you are somehow immune to all of this stuff that's happened in the two years, that you are just, you're a leader and you can take everybody else's mm -hmm. problems and help everybody else, but you're not somehow also living it too, and experiencing it too, of course you have been, right? There's no immunity island from this pandemic. So the, the first part of it is understanding how you can use transparency in your favor. I think it has been a, tr a cultural tradition that from a leadership you kind of play it close to the best, like you don't. You don't always share what some of your struggles are, and sometimes, you know, people don't want to know, right? No. The chair of our department says, nobody needs to know how the sausage is made, uh, right, uh, behind the scenes. So, which I appreciate that she's kind of protecting us from some of that, but we also need to understand what her struggles are so that it's more relatable. And the research is clear that being transparent with your staff and faculty about how you are doing, um, not being an open book of self-disclosure, Right, but sharing a little bit more than you may have traditionally is a good thing. There's a, there are personal boundaries around that for everyone. Healthier boundaries and engagement. What this means 
I've said this so many times. If, if I could make my entire living as a clinical psychologist on um, people's problems with boundaries and their relationships with their parents, I'd be a millionaire. Right? We have trouble with boundaries. We do not do well with boundaries. What I mean by this is that when you're at work, you need to be on. You need to be there, you need to be trying to engage as much as possible. And when you are done, you're done. You're not available. You're not responding to emails. You have a distinct cutoff time. I'm not telling you what it should be, because everybody likes to work at different times. But we need to have on work, or like at work on, on call, there's a window with clear boundaries, and off. What we usually have is on and less on. And that's not going to work anymore. So think about what you can do this summer to practice that a little bit and get it set up for yourself and into fall. Be oriented around your core values. I'm going to give you a worksheet. We're not going to have time to do today, but I'll, I'll send it along so you can do it later if you'd like. Um, and be genuine. Like, really be real and truthful about what the struggles are, what the successes are. That transparent communication is very well supported in recovery. As a leader and part of the system, um, if you don't do it already, please consider putting kudos, congratulations, and successes on the second item of the agenda of your meetings. What usually happens is that they're the last thing, and then if you run out of time, which people usually do, it gets cut. And part of what contributes to compassion fatigue is not understanding compassion rewards. All the stuff that's going well that we love about our work, the successes that teachers are having with students that are happening with committees, right? We just we just are so focused on the problem that we lose sight of the success. So putting those successes as a priority to call out and draw attention to is going to help reduce compassion. Um, make some cultural shifts. Do not education is not so good at making <laughs> making a lot of changes. Although we did it, right? We did it with the online and all the stuff. What I mean by this is be willing to walk away from whatever was happening in 2019 that was not healthy. Right? Be willing to walk away from programs and systems and, and procedures that didn't that you don't want to carry forward into the next academic year. This is the time. This is the time to make those changes. It's, a, it's an opportunity that the disaster sometimes can create. Um, contribute to a culture where people can process stuff. Talk about grief and loss. I bet that is just not something that's come up much at faculty meetings before. I know it hasn't where I work, but it needs to be part of the cultural consideration here. And then the most important thing is, is walking the talk. If you think boundaries are a priority, then show that to people. Human beings do not do what they're told, they do what they're shown. We copy what other people do, and as leaders, we have incredible um, opportunity to model healthy recovery from this by taking care of ourselves. So it's not, it's not a selfish thing, as much as I don't like the word self-care, right? Okay. Um, I just want you to consider this, and then I'm going to wrap up and take some questions in there. When was the last time you thought about your personal core values? I know some of you have, but I'm guessing not everybody has. That's the worksheet that I'm going to provide. Um, my contention is this. If you go into a really challenging meeting or a one-on-one, -on -one, and you just you know it's going to be hard, right? If you're talking about something that's sensitive or difficult, whatever the case may be, but you are grounded in your core values. Susie and I were talking before this, and she said hers is her, one of her primary values is honesty. One of my primary values is hopefulness. Right? So if I'm going into those challenging meetings with that hopefulness mindset or honesty mindset, no matter how the, the actual outcome of the meeting goes, I'm going to feel better about it if I behave in a way that's consistent with my core values. So if honesty is the value, and you're going into a difficult meeting and you're dishonest, in some form or fashion with yourself, with them, you're going to have a bad feeling after the meeting. It's not going to sit well. But if you're anchored in what really matters to you as a human being, even the really hard conversations are going to go better, even when you can't control the outcomes. Because process is what matters. That's where we have power. We get so bogged down in content, all the rules, all the steps you have to follow, especially with this pandemic, it is process over content. Process is how we talk to each other, how we engage, how we relate, how we behave. That's where we can be in power. So the core values is going to help with that a little bit. Um, this is the process. So this is the worksheet. 
that I'm going to make sure to share out with you via email later. Identify a couple of them that become the base of this pyramid for yourself. This is what you're operating from. And then pick one or two that are your highest priorities. For me right now, the two that I'm focused on are gratitude and patience. <coughs> I really struggle with patience. I have a four-year-old and a six-year-old. They give me opportunities every day to practice being more patient. Um, but that's what I really, I, I really want to be that person. I don't want to be a patient person. So I, I need to look for opportunities when I'm responding to them. When I'm responding to my graduating seniors, I have two senior seminar classes right now. and. They have senioritis, they're done. They were done two weeks ago with, with college, right? They want to be out of here. Patience. Patience is important to me, right? So I'm going to respond to their emails and to their requests from that, from that lens. Um, so you pick one or two, and then you think about how it's going to show up. So for me, it's going to show up with my kids. It's going to show up in my email responses with my students. That's how I practice. So it's concrete. I know what I can do more of. Um, and then you look out for opportunities, you seek them out. How do I practice being that thing? For gratitude, you know, doing a little reflection about how what went well today, what I'm grateful for, that's a way to increase that. So those are just some examples, and they need to be unique to you. But it needs to be concrete. And my experience in clinical psychology is that the more concrete it is and operational it is, the more useful. Right? From a practical perspective. All right, here's, here's the end. Um, best practices about research and what do we know works. We have to reconnect with the stuff that fills us up. We have been functioning in emergency management mode for such a long time. And we have to somehow transition our thinking and our behavior into like, I love this job for these reasons and I'm trying to do more of this thing. Rather than react, react, right? Call out the effort. Call out the successes, acknowledge it, and that includes stuff you're doing. I'm guessing that doesn't happen very often. Even if you don't have to do it publicly, right? To, to, to give yourself time to acknowledge how hard you're working on things. And maybe take the opportunity at this conference to share that with each other, right? Because everybody in the room can identify with something that you're experiencing right now. So share some successes and what works well. Orienting yourself around your core values will give you a sense of direction for heading into next year. It's, it, it works, we know that it does. Um, and then the limbic system thing. Take time, just take a little moment before you hit send on the email. One of my colleagues at the Department of Health with that role, she and I often will, she'll send me an email that's cl clearly for somebody else, right? She'll like, read this, tell me if I'm too unhinged. Like, <laughs> is it okay, right? Have a, have a COVID brain buddy. You can run something by to see if it's okay before you get in. Um, and then be an advocate, right? Be an ally. We all are going through a really challenging time, and being transparent about that process is definitely going to contribute to collective resiliency. So, thank you. I'll take some questions if there are. Yes, I will repeat the question when it gets asked. This information we have already been shared. Will we have access? Yes. Okay. You, the question is, you will have access to the slides, yes. I, I sent them to someone, but I want to make sure that they get sent out. Yes. Uh, when you were talking about you were checking the survey to see where they were, yeah. and um, you talked about hopelessness, so what are the next steps if someone has hopelessness? What would you do next? Right. Um, I would dig a little bit further. I know I'm talking about a different perspective, right? So it depends on your, oh, sorry. The question was, when someone talks about hopelessness, um, what do you do next? If you can tell that they're hopeless, what do you, what's the next step? Um, my inclination would be to get more information. And what you don't want to do is fix it, right? You can't. You can't fix. <laughs> if someone's really feeling hopeless, you're not fixing it. Um, so you don't want to talk them out of it. Oh, it's not that bad. Oh, it'll be fine, right? We've all heard these things, and when they come our way, it doesn't feel good. So if someone's feeling really hopeless, you can um, ask them more about it, right? Get them to sort of process what is contributing to that. And I'm not inviting anybody to be a junior woodchuck therapist here, right? You don't have to. Um, there's no badge for that. But just more open-ended questions, like um, making sure you understand what they mean. If they say, I'm feeling really hopeless, like, 
right now. Well, what do you really, what do you mean by that? That sounds, that sounds bad. What do you mean? Um, more questions, more questions, more questions. Oftentimes, in ten, five or ten minutes, if you continue to pursue information about that, it helps the speaker process their experience and get some movement on it, one way or the other. If at the end of five or ten minutes you're, you're feeling like, wow, this person is actually depressed, this is clinical, this is outside of my area of expertise, um, again, depending on your role and relationship with them, I would want to have a potential referral source or to, to check in with them on a regular basis. Hopelessness is a huge risk factor. So it's, it's worth following up. Yeah. Do you, do you have any recommendations about screen time and Olympic system? <laughs> Uh, do you have any recommendations about screen time and the limit system? Yes. Yeah. Um, it's so complicated with screen time. Um, we were talking about that right before, too. Um, I just did an interview about suicide rates for adolescents, and I believe very strongly that we are layering, it's a layered cake. So, children now, anybody who's younger than 18, 20, grew up with technology. Right, had an exposed exposure all the time. It is something that we relied on and we had to, and I, as a parent I did the same thing during the pandemic. There was way more tablet time screen time than normally it would be. That's just the way it was. The thing that's happening is that for human beings and regulating the limbic system, especially for kids, they need to be given the opportunity to learn how to regulate distress without an external device. So when something's bad, when I'm sad or if I'm scared, I can't use a tablet or a phone or something outside of my body to make me feel better. I have to learn the skills to regulate that emotional experience on my own. And that's the problem. So we're, we're, we're starting with that as a foundation and then we're layering in trauma and pandemic and isolation for kids. And that's part of what's contributing to the suicide perspective. So the bottom line answer to your question about screen time is that there is no magic number. The research is very clear that there is no magic number differs depending on how neurotypical or divergent the kid is. It depends on what the options are for social interaction. Video games have, have saved lives in the pandemic because they've let adolescent kids team up and communicate and, and be together in a way that they couldn't be physically. So it's not all bad. The issue is that we have to help kids regulate distress without the device. That's the part that's missing. So it's not that technology is bad or screen time is bad. It's that it has to be used appropriately. It has to be monitored so you know who kids are talking to online. And we have to try to provide them developmentally and educationally with practice in regulated distress. Adults aren't even very good at it. So we can all use a little more there. Yeah. Uh, what would be, I guess, guidance you would offer in a situation like Who's frequently in the red zone? Okay. That you mentioned. So, oh, that's Okay, so you're working with somebody who's frequently in the red zone. Um, depends on what your relationship is. Everything's going to start with it depends. It's in clinical psychology. Um, so, it depends on if there's a safety issue. Like, I would be, I would want some information. I would want to know is there a safety issue? Is this person always running in red? Is this a reaction to you personally, or is it how they are, right? What's the context? Um, there are people that are operating in a highly activated limbic system way most of their day. And it's not unique to you know, specific people, it's just how they function. Um, and it's not so healthy, right? And can be very off-putting. Um, but depending on whether you see this as kind of a norm for them, or if this is a new thing, it's a, a change in behavior, you can't really approach it. So if it's a norm for them, um, then you have the relationship space to address it. I would I would try to address it. I would address it directly. And not be like, hey, you're mad all the time. Why is that? <laughs> but like try to sit down next to them, right? And 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 figure out what's going on that could be driving it. If you think it's situational, if you think this is characterological, which is just how they are, then there probably isn't a whole lot you can do actually. So it depends on the source and it depends on your relationship with them. I hate to say that. Yeah. I believe that's true. about the, uh, what is the, the lesser two evils to have to completely disconnect 
um, being a mid-level administrator as dean, and saving stuff go away for a week or two. And that stress involved with what I'm coming back to versus answering it now. So I feel like if I can answer an email, like if I can answer a text, I can answer an email if it's a straightforward answer. And also, people are still working while I'm gone. You know what I mean? So I don't want them to be stressed about something they need from me, but I do need to disconnect. And also, a second thing is that I chose this position, but I'm also thinking about as a faculty member, having that time off and them coming back in August and being rejuvenated. But I'm like, I've been here all summer. You know what I mean? So what? I mean, not in a negative way. It's just like I'm thinking I've been working. And my, if I have a week off, I'm not going to have that level of that feeling. But that's a choice I make. Why I can't put that on anyone else? So there's no answer to that. I'm just thinking out loud. Like, what do, what do I do? But I can't. Well, I guess, I think y'all heard that question, yes. comment. Um, I guess I would ask you, what do you think it's going to take, starting with the people in this room, to change the culture around how we handle patients? What, like, when you know someone's gone who's a peer of yours, right, what is it that you can do when they're gone to not send them 55 emails that are going to step back? What, how can you, so that it rotates, right, so you take a little bit off their plate when they're gone, and then the culture becomes that this is just what we do for each other because that's not what the culture is right now right the culture is it doesn't matter if they're gone or not i'm sending 100 emails that can sit there until they get back so i'm, I'm looking at it as a the long the long process here how do we change the culture of expectation around that break time because i mean it's it's math actually i hate but it's math we know that people have to have the, the break in order to stay okay and we're not giving anybody the so the math is clear. We need to give more of a break. We need to take a break. And the way to, to facilitate that is to change the expectation about how that's done. And to start with your start with your division, unit, building, however that works, right? On a really small scale, and then we can work at it more. But I think you know, changing the culture around expectation is, and we have to. And if that part to actively listen, as you taught us today. And not always problem solved. I, I want to share uh, an example with my, with my colleagues. Thank you. I just said that I wanted to share an example with my colleagues about strategies that we use at, at Seattle Colleges when we need to disconnect. We have administrators in charge. And so whenever one of us is gone, you know, we put in an automatic reply that if there's something that's urgent, you know, you can respond to this other dean. Uh, reach out to them who can support you. I also received this tidbit recently from a colleague who said that when they are away and come back to Google out some emails, they delete them all. And then they start over. They say, well, if it's important, they'll, they'll, they'll respond back. Or they'll, 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 they'll reach back out to me. And so that was a strategy that I have not implemented. But I was like, what? <laughs> so I just want, I didn't know how everybody would respond to that, but I wanted to share it. And I have what they're all trying to share it to you. I just wanted to share it. That is a very great strategy. <laughs>
I think it uh, says a lot about their comfort level with you, for sure, if this is something that you've encountered before, which I think is a positive. Um, I would encourage you to think about what your boundaries, boundaries need to be for yourself around how long that goes on, and because you're not a clinician, and that role might not be appropriate to have an idea in your head, depending on why it's happening. Right? It's a, it's a three-minute thing or a ten-minute thing. What's the boundary for you? And to also then identify the boundary and come up with a way to say um, something along the lines of, I can see that this is incredibly hard, what you're experiencing right now. Um, I, I care about what's happening, and I'm sorry to have to transition us away, but I need to move on to this other thing right now. You can say that directly and kindly and with empathy in a way that works. Um, yeah, it really does depend on why it's happening, right? And to ask them about other resources. Is there anybody else that you have that you're comfortable talking about this? Because it helps diffuse some of the options. And that's problem solving. I hear myself, I know that's problem solving. And if they say, yeah, but I'm just more comfortable here right now. So, okay, well, I'm, I'm happy to sit with you for another minute or two, and then we need to, we need to move on. But the boundaries are going to be essential to that. I'm just, it happens to me too. <laughs> and so I wanted to let you know that whatever you're doing, I'm also doing that thing, and you're not alone. And for whatever reason, there's something about me that people find calming, especially since I'm faculty, students. Sometimes students that I don't, haven't had it for, in classes for months, years, still come to me. And it's, it's, very taxing, but at the same rate, I think there's something about me that they feel comfortable with. I just want to say, like, I, I see, I see you, right? <clears throat> One thing that's helped me, and I don't know if you can co-sign on this, that list of resources, I'll pull it out and say, here's what my institution has, um, and walk through, there's this, there's this, there's that, there's counseling, there's, you know, all these different things, I'm happy to help navigate these things and emails, CC you on them, so we can establish a communication with you in like, you know, our therapy sessions and things like that, just to kind of get them over to a person who can actually do more than, you know, what I can do, so. I think the resources are good. Another idea or a consideration I'd like you to have in your head is that just because emotions are coming out of someone else doesn't mean they're going into you. And so this is a clinical training thing that I learned in graduate school. But my supervisor told me to imagine yourself with a, with a really thin but incredibly strong like titanium silk sheet like body. You're covered in that and you're protected. So whatever crazy or mad or sad is being put out from someone else, you can be with them, and you can be in proximity to them as they're expressing that stuff, and you are safe. And all you have to do is imagine that, right? It's not a real thing. But they, that, that gives them the space to express, and then you don't, you're not taking it on and keeping yourself up at night. Just those tricks like that. It's another type of memory, actually. Emotional. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? opportunity for that nobody shows up, right? Um, what they're saying when they say they want to be back is they want to feel connected to something bigger. They want to feel in community with other people and they want to have fun in a, in a, in a good way. Um, but the problem is is that because nobody has ever lived through anything like this, 
we're building the plane as we're flying it, and there is no playbook. Right? There's no like set of instructions that anybody can follow. But if what they want is connection, they need to also feel safe in doing that. I, I feel very convicted that it will happen eventually. Like we will get to a point with the endemic nature of this, where it's not going to be as much. It's never going to be the same. Right, but it will get to a point where it normalizes and sort of equalizes itself out with social participation. Right now, where things stand, I, I think there's still enough uncertainty and enough risk for a lot of folks that they they think they want that, but they go and you come to a room and you're like, ooh, like this feels weird or too easy for them. They leave, or they just they they knock themselves out of it. It's not going to stay that way because we're in the process of figuring out how to make this work. Um, it doesn't surprise me at all that it's happened, but I don't think next year, we'll see what happens with the variants and things, but when people decide this is the way it's going to be, rather than a temporary condition, that's when we're going to start to see how we norm it out, how many people show up to stuff, and what the on-campus life actually looks like. We're just not there yet. I think this year, will, this next year, will give us a much clearer perspective on that. I'm afraid to ask. between empathy and demand when it comes to expectations. Like, this is what you have to do. Yeah. Um, I, I actually don't see them as being opposed to each other. I think you can be very clear with, with expectations and, and follow it up with something like, look, the expectation is that you respond to emails when the students send them. I'm hearing you say how hard that is and why it's so challenging, and I wish it were different. But that is the expectation, nonetheless. I, I, I get it that it's hard, it still just needs to happen. So you can you can state and express the expectation in an empathetic way. And it's they it can go together. It's not like I'm listening to you and now I'm gonna, you know, take care of business and I'm done doing it. Like you can, you can do that, do the business through the process of empathy. And not make them adverse to each other. Anything else? Yes. I've asked this without up here every time. So how have you altered your pedagogy as a professor to deal with traumatized students since the pandemic? Yes, uh, for me personally. How do I have it right done? Um, there's been a lot more alteration. That's what adaptability is. Um, some of it I'm less comfortable with than others. Um, do I think the quality of the academic expectation has suffered? Yeah. Um, is that, does that make sense in the context of a disaster cascade? Yes, absolutely. Are the, are the graduating seniors that I have now slightly less equipped than the ones that graduated before the pandemic? Probably. Is there any other choice for it? No. Right? So the way I've altered my syllabus, the way I've altered my expectations, mostly it's around flexibility with time. It's not, I didn't actually change the assignments. I actually didn't at all um, from a pedagogical perspective, but I changed uh, the expectation around flexibility with what's happening in time frames that people need to do things. Um, leaving a lot of things, like offering extensions pretty pretty much, with uh, I think only two exceptions that I can think of. If someone asks for an extension, I would give it to them. Prior to the pandemic, it was very situationally dependent and also I needed to have 24 hours notice before I would say yes. They had to ask me ahead of time to get that extension. I, it's a little bit, uncomfortable for me, but I, I don't do that anymore. So that's been the biggest change, is the flexibility of the time. Yeah. Time for one more question.
have a conversation. Yeah. Um, the question is, how do you get your colleagues to be flexible and a little bit less rigid in this climate? People cling on to rigidity because it makes them feel safe a lot of times. So it's, I, I mentioned that adaptability is the hardest one of the resilience ingredients. It's just because it's just hard for humans to, to change. We don't like it so much. Um, I would have a conversation about asking them what their concerns are about being adaptive. And being specific, like if, if you don't want to adapt your time frames, your syllabus, your grading criteria, whatever they may be, why why is that the case? Like, what's the perspective? And it's, I would guess, there's something they're they're afraid is going to happen. That they're not going to learn as much. Um, that the class won't be as helpful. I'm not sure, but I, there's a fear-based thing. If you can get them to talk about um, addressing whatever it is that's causing the fear it's much more likely to put them at ease and be willing to make that change. Because the fear is, the fear of whatever, is keeping them from being willing to try something. So if you address the fear, that should change. Domino. So I think it's interesting, um, I, I hope you all have received a plethora of really tangible ideas and strategies that you can bring back to your families, to yourselves, um, to your peers, to your faculty and students. Um, this is now the fourth time I've heard Kara speak, and each time I learned something new, and I hope you did too. Um, I, I think it was interesting the laughter that went around the idea of the um, abolishing email um, that Chelsea brought up. So I just want to add a, a, another layer to that, because I've seen it now at my college with multiple vice presidents and multiple deans, so it can be done. One little twist on it is if you put your out of office message that says, I will be back on this day, if your message is really important, please resend it to me on this day. So it will be on the top of your inbox because you know it's going to take you days and weeks and maybe never to get to the bottom of your inbox. But that puts the onus on them to resend it to you if it is important. So it can be done and your mental health is worth it. We also, most of us get a lot of vacation time, and so you might not be able to do that every time, and that's okay, but deliberately pick, I, try, I personally pick two times a year where I'm going to do that, and I'm really, really going to check out. It's not every time, but two deliberate times a year um, is what I need for my semi-sanity. If a vacation seems terrifying because of that, what I would really suggest thinking about is looking at your seven day week and picking a chunk of hours, starting with a very, very small chunk of hours, like I'm just picking Sunday afternoon as a random, right? Noon to four on Sunday afternoon, you are not ever looking at work email. You're not ever responding to things. You're not like chunk. And start, I mean, maybe four hours is too much. I don't know, I hope not. But pick a chunk of time that seems not scary, and then slowly start to expand it. And then when you get to a seven-day vacation, you've got some practice. But start small. Please join me in thanking Dr. Gary.